verses 5 to 6. If Pastor Rudy isn't here, we'll call Pastor Carter to come and read that for us. In her stead. Everyone please stand if you can stand in honor of the reading of God's word. That which we have seen and heard declare we unto you, that he also may have fellowship with us, and truly our fellowship with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And these things write we unto you, that your joy may be full. This then is the message which we have heard from him, of him, and declare unto you, that God is light, and in Him is no darkness at all. Bless the Lord. Amen. Amen. God's word. Jesus. Praise God. As we remain standing, we want to give you a tremendous welcome, but also we want to recognize our speakers and our bishops that are coming in the absence of bishop. And uh, Pastor Chichi Bismarck will give you tremendous greetings. Also, our assistant presiding bishop, Bishop Hugh Daniel Smith. Come on, let's give God a praise. Reflect the awesome glory and splendor of our great God. 
So today, I pray you will be strong, you will, you will listen, pay attention, make notes, and retain what you've been taught. To so those things you've heard will benefit you and your church and your family. We have not made this afternoon this morning. My, my mother-in-law, 89 is of age, and she, 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 uh, she said that I, she is my handbag because wherever I go, she goes with me. Uh, banquets, my wife doesn't want to go. She come with me. Events, prison in the country of Trump Creek, wherever she comes with me. So she has a magnificent voice. So I wanted to come and sing something for us in this meeting. Mother of Frida Kahlo.
speaking. 
and he has blessed our soul ever since. He came to our church in October last year and with a magnificent blessing to us. The DVDs are still playing, CDs are still playing, but we're talking about it again, how we fall and bring changes to our lives. We're at this afternoon, this morning, to present to you uh, the word of a speaker of this morning, Bishop Mark. In your kingdom. But 
Jesus answered and said, You know not what you ask. Are you able to drink the cup that I shall drink of and be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? They say unto him, We are able. And he went a little further and fell on his face and prayed and said, Oh my father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou will. Let's pray. Father, we thank you this morning for the grace that is in this place. We thank you, Father, for what you've already done so far in this conference. We are so grateful to just be here and to hear what you are saying unto us. This morning we pray, open up our eyes, open up our ears, so that we can hear what the Spirit of God is saying unto us. And everyone say, Amen. 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 What I really want to do this morning is to try and present to you what a genuine man of God looks like. In the book of the Art of War, the writer lists five things, five character flaws which are dangerous for a genuine. I'm going to just mention them. We won't have time to expand on them. But these are character flaws that can put an army into trouble if a general displays them. He says, if I am reckless as a general, my men can be killed. If I'm a coward, my army can be captured. If I am short-tempered, I will react in anger. If I am self-important, I can be deceived. And if I am emotionally attached to my men, I will hesitate at the crucial moment. Profound. If I go back to the book of Samuel, we are introduced to a remarkable woman by the name of Hannah. Now Hannah is one of the most godless women in scripture, in my opinion. She lived in holiness, but she also had tremendous insight into what the plan of God was for the whole nation. And I saw the spiritual condition of the house of God. And I saw some things that the ordinary human being would not just see. She saw the spiritual and moral decline of God's people and she saw the departure of the glory. She saw that God would forgive Eli for his failure, but not restore him or his sons to the priestly office. She saw that there would not be another priest unless she birthed it. Many people think that Hannah was desperate. Because normally when people are barren, there's a tendency that they become desperate for a child. But I know that Hannah was not desperate. How do I know she was not desperate? Because when you're desperate, you settle for anything. Can I speak about some of the ladies that have reached a certain age? They have become desperate and then they signal for anything. But Hannah was not desperate. She didn't signal for anything. Because if you signal for anything and you bear it, you say to God, anything will do. I don't care if it's 
a boy or a girl, as long as I can be fruitful. But Hannah knew that she had to ask God for a male child. Because she knew that the nation needed another priest. So she was very specific in her request. And she asked God for a male child because of what she saw. Let me just give you some things that she saw. She saw that the sons of Eli knew not the Lord. They were professional Christians. They were having a form of godliness, but they were denying the power they owed. I know some in the church today. And I saw how they mismanaged the finances because they missed with the offerings. And I saw how did they changed the order of God to suit their needs and to justify their sin. Right. And I saw sexual sins in the house of God. Right. Right. I mean, they had no fear for God. Right. They were sleeping with a woman in the church. And I saw that there's a lack of discipline for um, the spiritual father early. Right. And it resulted in compromised leadership. Right. Because Eli knew what they were doing, but he didn't have the guts to correct them. Right. And I saw that there was no revelation of God's word. First Samuel chapter 3, verse 1. There was no open revelation. And I saw that there was an inability to hear the voice of God. And I saw that the glory of God has departed. Because the Bible says here the lamp of God went out. And I saw that there was no succession plan. And no gener generational legacy. Because when Eli died, his sons died with him. And all because of what she saw. She made up her mind that I need to give birth to a man child that I'm not going to keep for myself, but I'm going to give it back to God because I need to provide God with the faithful please. What I want us to do, we're talking to pastors. I'm just going to mention three things that disqualify early sons. Because it's the very three things that disqualify men and women of God today. The three things that I saw in 1 Samuel chapter 2 is immorality. Immorality. I know we like the messages that makes you jump up and down on the seat. But this morning we're speaking to leaders. Can I be open and plain yes, and speak to you truthfully? Yes. Because there's a lot of mess going on in the body of Christ. And we have been sensitized. It's almost like we're abnormal. Because in, in our days, when we were growing up, this thing was not acceptable. But now it's become acceptable. People just love anyway. They like, I'm talking about men of God. Anointed servants of God. I said it's going to be rough, so just bear with me. It will get better. But immorality is on the high in the church. And no one is saying anything about it. So it looks like we've been sensitized to accept this thing. But tell your neighbor, I'm the real deal. I'm not going to mess with God. And I'm not going to mess with the holy anointing that he has placed on my life. But I'm going to be a pure vessel. I'm going to remain pure. You know what I've realized? Um, if a pastor is immoral, I wrote this in my book. We don't transfer what we say. We transfer who we are. Can I say that again? We don't transfer what we say. We transfer who we are. So if we are immoral, it's going to be a reflection of the whole church. The whole church 
is going to be immoral. You're going to find people in the worship team that falls in sin. You're going to find people among your leaders that fall in sin. Because the man of God is in sin. Tell your neighbor, I'm the real deal. Which means I am going to purpose in my heart like Daniel, not to defile what God has given me. The anointing of God is too precious on our lives to define and contaminate it with woman or with men. So we have the three G's. The girls, the glory, and the gold. But immorality, we have to make a decision that no matter what we do, we remain pure before God. No matter what temptation comes our way, we're going to remain pure. I am going to love my wife. I'm not going to look around. I'm not going to mess around because I see a God. I believe that the comfort of the Holy Spirit is in the church, but the fear of God is coming back to the church. I am fully persuaded of that. Some of the things that men got away, they're not going to get away with it anymore. But we have to purpose in our hearts that we as Chapula, our prelude loves his wife. I am going to love his, my wife. Bishop Brooks and Pastor Vaughan has been married for over 34 years. Am I right? Yes, yes. And they're not planning to get a divorce. Amen. So we have good examples. So let's not be contaminated with some of the leaders because America doesn't set the standards.
Can I say that again? Money is so powerful, it's the only thing that God compares himself with. God said there's only two masters. Mammon and him. And the devil is not one of them. It's money and God. So we have preachers that soul that sell their soul. You don't want me to talk about it. <laughs> There's some people that you will never be able to invite to your church because you can't afford them. Because they're not in the ministry for the sake of the ministry. The ministry has become a business. They in it and they will go where they'll get the highest honorarium. Let it not be so among the Jabula pastors. Let us not have a contract that is 10 pages long if someone invites us to come and share what has changed our lives. Let's be pure. Financial corruption is rising the church. We cannot allow that among us is Jabula. I'm speaking to family. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So we can't allow that. Even there's some places that God will send you on an assignment where they won't give you an honorarium. But your attitude still needs to be the same because your source is God. It's not man. Then there's rebellion. Because they were knowingly disobeying what they knew what was right. Rebellion. Disqualify. Ill effects from the priesthood. Rebellion. We have that in the church. Um, I just want to go a different route on this one to help senior pastors. Because sometimes we as senior pastors creates rebellion in gifted people that is in our midst. All right. Let me explain. We don't have an exit strategy in the church for people that are gifted and people that have a call of God upon their lives. So what we do as senior pastors, we will frustrate the hell out of them and they will become rebellious because we don't want to lose them because they're so valuable to our current and our local ministry. Right, right. But you have to, you know, if a son grows up in the ministry, or let's take Matthew, let's be on his case. <laughs> his, his time is running out in mommy's house. <laughs> because when, when a boy reaches a certain age and he's still staying with his mother, we say there's something wrong. He's grown up. Yeah. What is he still doing with his mother? He must either get married or he must go stay on his own. Okay. You can't have a 60 year old who's still staying with his mother. Then there's something wrong. But in the church, when we have people that have been with us for 15 years, who has a call of God upon their lives, who have a gifting on the inside of them, we recognize them, we even ordain them as pastors in our church, but we don't want to release them. We have to deal with this because this causes rebellion in the sons because of the father's insecurity.
disciples were not there. I mean, here's the man sweating blood. His face with the buttercup. He asked God, please remove this cup from my life. But I know it couldn't, it couldn't be removed because I was in that cup that he had to drink. My son was in that cup that he had to drink. So it could not be removed. But his disciples could not tarry with him even one hour. So sometimes as a senior pastor, you're going to find yourself in your greatest need and there'll be no one on your leadership team that you can talk to. The cup of no support. David had 400 men that came to him at the door. They came in debt, discontented and discouraged. Well, David is on his greatest need. He's running for his life. Before you get to the cup of blessing. 
Because Genesis 12 verse, verse 1, verse 1 says, God is going to make us, verse 2, He's going to make us and then He's going to bless us. So it's better to not have the order reverse. Some people are blessed, but then they haven't drink the cup of weakness and the cup of no support. So by the time they get blessed, they mess up because they can't, they cannot, they cannot handle the blessing of God. So the cup of blessing is when God just miraculously favors you. When things just go the right way for you. Then we will find the real deal. Then what I just want to talk about in the next few minutes is the three different types of leaders. Number one, we have self-appointed leaders. Number two, we have man-appointed leaders. And number three, we have God-appointed leaders. How can I identify a self-appointed leader? Number 16, verse 1 to 11. Korah is a self-appointed leader. A self-appointed leader is someone that takes upon himself the authority and the responsibility of a spiritual office in which he has not been divinely called. Let me show you in the church how a self-appointed leader will emerge. Number one, he will cause others to rise up against the existing leaders. That's what Korah did. He took 250 princes that were famous and prominent in the church to rise up against Moses. How do I know you are a self-appointed leader if you constantly, publicly criticize and question the existing leadership? You don't want me to talk about that one. I'm going to make a statement. <laughs> I'm not so sure if you can handle it. Sometimes there will be more grace to follow your leader even when he's wrong than to try and go against him. I'm not saying he's sinning, he's living in adultery, but there is sometimes that we as senior pastors go the wrong way because we do what we think is right and we haven't spent much time in prayer and we make a mistake. But even when that happens, you keep your mouth shut and you follow as a soldier. Can I say that again? It's so anointed. You keep your mouth shut and you follow as a soldier. Yes, sir. Amen. Number three, self-appointed leaders always accuse the leadership of what they themselves are guilty of. Because Korah was saying, you guys are taking too much responsibility on yourself. He wanted to carry Moses' burden. Number four, a self-appointed leader is someone that's not satisfied with his position that has been given to him and he constantly wants more authority and a higher position. Let me talk about this one. Last, yesterday Bishop made a statement that when you come to a church, you don't come to serve God. You come to serve the sick man and the sick woman of God. In serving them, you will serve God. Dangerous <laughs> statements. Yeah. But there's always people that have ambition. And the ambition is the microphone. <laughs> so they'll come to the church with one ambition. I want to preach. Yeah. Yeah. They don't come to serve. No, 
I wrote in my book something that Pastor Father likes. The degree you are willing to serve, you will also be able to lead. All right, yeah. Can I say that again? Yeah. Yeah. Right, yeah. The degree that you are willing to serve, yeah. you will also be able to lead. Yeah. Let me give you scripture because people like scriptures. Second Kings chapter 3 verse 11. When they wanted a prophetic voice, they were referred to Elisha. But it wasn't his prophetic gift that validated his ministry. When they inquired about him, they were asking him, this was what they said about him. He is the one that poured water on the hands of the prophet. That was just like being a maid. I help her. So for 10 years, he served the man of God. And when they wanted a prophet, they knew he had the prophetic word in his mouth. But the thing that qualified him was his serving gift, not his prophetic anointing. Can I say that again? The thing that qualified him was his serving gift, not his prophetic anointing. Number five, he con those that continue to murmur against existing leadership. Number 16, verse 11. Yes, sir. When the people murmured, God is displeased. So you'll find people in your church that are always just there to criticize you, to find fault with you, and to murmur about everything that every major decision you make as a senior pastor. Yes, sir. Let's go to men appointed leaders. Men appointed leaders are people who claim that God has called them, but the call is by the authority of human vessels who are not speaking by the action of God. So, male appointed leaders are those that take the ministry as a career. <laughs> so they have the qualification, but you don't, you need the qualification, but you also need the anointing. Yes, sir. Yes. Paul says, no dishonor unto himself. So the ministry is not a career. And in the 21st century, we have to pick the wrong concept for ministry. Right. That's why young men that comes up, they look at us. They have been through hell and death, yeah. but they desire to be like a bishop or bishop groups. They, they just see the curse and the glare He said, I mean, Bishop Reddit, 
the first session, they're going to take your daughters and put them in a system of slavery. They're going to take your young men and put them in a system of exploitation. But the people still say, we want a king. So a self-appointed leader is someone that's out there to get what they want at the expense of the sheep. Yes, 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 sir. Men appointed leaders are hirelings. You know what's a hiring? He will move to another church for a better salary. Because if anything has a career, it's not a calling. They won't stay in a small church once God elevates them. They will look for better opportunities. Sometimes we have to move. But there are some times we're faithful over your 200 people in an area that is not well esteemed. Where not all the middle class people are. And God will test you right there to see if you're faithful. Men appointed leaders are hirelings. God appointed leaders are called. So was the people's choice, not God's choice. That's why he lacked oil. Because the anointing, if you look at the anointing of David and you look at the anointing of Saul, they anointed Saul with a small bottle, a vial, a small glass bottle. Didn't have enough oil. But when they anointed David, the oil, the oil was moving all over him. So that means the person is the anointing. Yes, sir. A God appointed leader have a genuine call from God. Because somehow there was a divine and encounter that they had with God. Yes, yes. God called some of these men by their name. Yes. Moses was called out of a burning bush. Yes. First Samuel uh, 3 verse 4 tells us God spoke to Samuel and called him yes. at a young age. Yes. Mark 1 verse 20 says God called his disciples. And they must have seen something in him yeah. where they were prepared to drop their business yeah. to follow a carpenter. Ah. I still marvel at that. Yes, but he must have had something to follow. But they were called. X9, God called Saul yes. by his name. Yes. Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Yes. So there must be a divine encounter with God if you're going to survive in the ministry there must be something that is just above normal because when times get tough the tough will get tougher because of the call of God that is burned on the inside of you when there's no money and, and you want to close the church you will remember the call because there's a strong conviction on the inside of you that I'm not but I'm in this thing because God has called me. I'm going through it. I'm going to drink every cup that I need to drink. I'm going to stand and be a faithful servant. But there must be a call. There must also be an appointment. An appointment means to oversee, to care for, to watch over. Levi or the Levitical tribe were appointed to carry the ark. Yes. Numbers 26 verse 16, the sick man is appointed by God. Numbers 27 verse 22, Joshua was appointed by Moses. Yes. Then there's also the separation. Numbers uh, X 13 verse 2, Separate me, Paul and Barnabas, for the work that is involved. So, we don't have time, but separation comes after a number of years. But we don't have time to elaborate on that. 
It's when God sets you aside. With the separation comes the sin. So you need to be called, you need to be appointed, you need to be separated, and you need to be sent. To be sent means you have a specific and unique assignment. So I don't want to be bishop. You know in South Africa there are so many bishop Christmas. You'll be shocked. The guys... <laughs> the guys walk like bishop. They have the cap like this, like bishop. Uh, they speak like bishop. Some of them, I can tell you, they even preach better than bishop. <laughs> because they have studied the man. Bishop just laughs when I talk about us. What did Because I said to him, I said to him about a one man, he's too much you. <laughs> I know, sometimes I'm, I'm just immature, I just speak. <laughs> me and, that's why me and Pastor Bon get so long. Uh, we just speak. <laughs> I like, please write this down. This is what John Maxwell said. He just helped me so much. He said, imitation yeah. is the first Discovery of self. Yeah. Profound. Imitation is imitation when you imitate somebody. It's the first discovery of self. Yeah. So that means you will get to a point yeah. where you will stop trying to be somebody else. <laughs> because God has not called you to be bishop. I love him, but I'm not even going to attempt to find to the <laughs> Because I will lose the purpose of God. That's why I am not afraid to speak after Bishop. This guy, we were invited to a conference once, and he heard, I am the speaker, he is the speaker and Bishop. So he said to the, the host, please put me first. I don't want to speak after Bishop. I understand protocol. But nobody wanted to speak after Bishop. So I said, no, I'll speak. It's fine. Because I'm not going to be Bishop. I'm going to be Mark. I'm not a copy. I'm the original. Yes, sir. What is holy? Yes, sir. They will say so. 
Should we end our life to teach for people who want to pass us a minute? This is a standard lesson. You know what it is? Yes. Every bishop, every, every bishop, everybody needs to study this again in more detail. This is awesome. It's an awesome. Some announcements we have. It's, it's been those Americans with their faith ministries. Just legal groups. We have Priscilla Jones. My best receipt is in sale. They're ten pounds. And of course, we have a lunch for lunch, wings, and things. All of the place during the break, like that now, to avoid delay. And that's fine. But I just want to know, Bishop, Mark, we are so proud of your your ministry. We are so proud. And yet we are pleased you came and spoke this is boldness. I'm surely impacted by you every time I hear you. You're amazing. And I know there's greater works. Please just be yourself. Just be yourself. No, maybe Bishop Jakes and no Jones. Bishop Jones, Bishop Jakes testified with trying to do a no Jones with Mike. I think his teeth out, so. You got a master where you are. This is the first service of the morning, based on the word, based on the information, based on its impact. We have to give an offering now. Bishop Mark has got a book uh, based on what he has taught us today, called Rising Through the Ranks. You can get it from his website. It's called Lobo Worship. So if you just uh, log on to Lobo Worship. Uh, you'll be able to uh, purchase his book called Rising Through the Ranks. Thank you.